Welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry I've put you in the dungeon. Um, my name is Amanda White TG, and I'm the managing director at Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis. Because we have a very limited time frame today, um, and I've been asked to be very specific about our structure, I am throwing caution to the wind, um, and I'm going to stick to a script. So I apologize for sacrificing theatricality, but I think to get this information to you concisely, um, I may as well just keep myself from going on tangents. Um, I, we will, I'll speak for about 20 minutes and give you a lot of information about this program, and then I invite you for the remaining 15 to 20 minutes that we have left to throw out any questions you have about what I may have missed. Um, at the end, AMS has asked us together to consider um, which of the five models they presented earlier this afternoon uh, you think radical hospitality fits into, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go, and um, our generous uh, team will take down those results. So we'll talk about that at the end. Um, the question I'm addressing today is, what is one way in which a theater company erases the cost barrier for its audiences and retains a sustainable business model? Mixed Blood was founded by a very young Jack Ruler in 1976 with the primary objective of attracting a non-traditional audience. So Jack tells me that he knew at the time what a traditional audience looked like and that it was not reflective of the world outside the theater doors. So that commitment to outreach is still in place at Mixed Blood today and it continues to shape access and audience engagement efforts in every form. I'm here to tell you about the company's most recent audience outreach initiative, Radical Hospitality, the no-cost admission effort that is changing the way we do business at Mixed Blood. We have many passionate conversations as a staff about how best to talk about this. That word free is a really charged word, um, but I'm up here by myself, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my own words and say it like this. Radical Hospitality started as a program that allowed Mixed Blood to give half of its seats away at every performance for no cost. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, is not totally new. I'm thrilled to say that we've talked about it this morning, um, even. So you'll, you'll hear some themes. It's important to be clear um, here before I get started about what I consider to be the first takeaway from our work on radical hospitality. This initiative came out of a, almost a decade of research and strategic planning around creating greater access to live theater in the Twin Cities. Um, that marathon, not sprint idea is really present here. The notion of removing artificial barriers in society is at the heart of Mixed Blood's work, so it was organic um, to what we, were, what we were committed to. To give you some background, in the 1999-2000 season, five strategic and staff-driven commitments were put to paper informally before they became the predecessors to Mixed Blood's strategic plan. With an assumption that who attends is at least as important as how many people attend, Mixed Blood went out in search of a specific audience for each specific production. That audience to which a play might most mightily speak and the audience for whom and by whom a play was created. Um, Woolly Mammoth, I imagine, is speaking right now about their own very successful um, connectivity model, which is uh, kind of reflective of this. This targeted marketing replaced a traditional theater marketing principle of attracting the general audience to the theater and then doing whatever we could do to get them to return. Since that shift in marketing efforts at Mixed Blood, audience diversity has continued and capacity has actually increased, but repeat attendance has been minimal, and I'll talk about that a little later on. That is one of the things that we're trying to learn at Mixed Blood about how we can get better at radical hospitality. Uh, next, a dedicated effort to finding audiences for culturally specific programming would be anchored by the creation of an ethno metro pass, a subscription that included all of Mixed Blood's main stage shows and then, in addition, four to five culturally specific productions in the Twin Cities produced by both culturally specific companies and also historically white institutions. The ethno metro pass exists still today but where it was initially designed to be an extension of Mixed Blood's um, specific marketing efforts, it's now designed to find an audience for those culturally specific uh, works. Third, our disability communities programming. Um, the staff made the decision at that time that seeking audiences from the worlds of disability would become a manifestation of the organization's mission, incorporated in program choices, in our marketing efforts, and in our audience services. 
The Twin Cities Latino population was growing significantly in the 90s as it continues to do and more and more Latino immigrants were calling Minnesota home. It was decided that plays by American Latinos, long produced by mixed blood, and intended for Latino audiences would be performed in Spanish and English by bilingual casts. This gets at another takeaway for radical hospitality that we've talked about already today as well. Authenticity is ultimately, we've learned, to entirely important in outreach efforts. Mixed Blood asked this growing community the question, what is keeping you specifically from attending? And the answer was, in part, a language barrier. Eliminating that barrier became a priority. And finally, season passes. These passes allowed maximum flexibility and were offered then as a sort of modified set subscription that was already in place. In addition, the Ethno Metro Pass would continue to offer the culturally specific theater to Mixed Blood's pass holders. In pursuit of these five strategic commitments, Mixed Blood built a foundation for access efforts that would support the coming decade. And now the game changer. We fast forward 10 years to 2008 when Minnesotans voted for the Legacy Amendment, which allowed a state sales tax increase um, with a dedicated percentage to go toward the arts specifically. And the state began collect collecting the tax in 2009. Mixblood has been the fortunate recipient of two Legacy Grants. So in 2009, with funding to support the research, Mixed Blood staff and board conducted strategic planning, revisited, revisiting mission, core values, and establishing strategic priorities. Connecting these four things, our mission, a vision that includes revolutionizing access, a core value of being egalitarian, and a strategic goal of developing new methods to attract and retain targeted populations as audiences, the staff and board went in pursuit of a direct answer to the question, what are the barriers to access for all uh, in the community of the Twin Cities? That same year, Mixed Blood hired a disability liaison and a Latino liaison. The establishment of a Latino advisory council began, and focus groups with leaders of disability organizations were conducted. Bathrooms, transportation, front of house demeanor were all identified as further barriers for people with disabilities, and language translation was again identified as a barrier for the monolingual Spanish speaker. Both groups identified cost and cultural content as barriers to participation. So in 2010, at the recommendation of Artistic Director Jack Ruler, Mixed Blood's board got right to the heart of the matter and explored the idea of free theater. They brought in MBA students, IT specialists, and other consultants, and ultimately unanimously endorsed the launch of what became known as Radical Hospitality. The next season brought a $191,000 grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board, supported by that legacy money, to explore, roll out, subsidize, and analyze the future Radical Hospitality. Eight months of development, including research into TCG's Free Night of Theater, Signature Theater's Ticket Initiative, and the public's Shakespeare in the Park led to Radical Hospitality's launch. We opened the doors in September 2011 to a line of people waiting outside the theater queued up for Radical Hospitality admission. It works like this. Two hours prior to showtime, the box office releases available Radical Hospitality admission to anyone who walks up and requests a seat in person. Mixblood has committed to reserving a significant percentage of the house for every performance for no cost admission. And as a rule, we try to keep it at around 50% of the, of the seats. If someone wants to guarantee their admission and not risk trying for a walk-up seat, they can reserve their seats ahead of time online or with the box office for a $20 fee. Starting two hours prior to showtime, when Radical Hospitality admissions are opened, it is no longer possible to purchase a seat. Anyone approaching the box office for a ticket is given one at no cost, and they're asked to make a donation if they're uncomfortable with complimentary admission. In, you'd be surprised. In addition to offering no cost seats to our guests, Mixed Blood's Disability Advisory Council advised that another major barrier to access for our guests with disabilities is transportation. As a result, Mixed Blood established a partnership with Red and White Cab of the Twin Cities, and uh, we now offer free round-trip cab rides to and from the theater for any guest self-identifying as having a disability. This is a well-funded program, um, but it's successful and marketing and promotion remains one of our challenges, interestingly enough. So to get to the heart of it, in season one, which was last season, our weekly attendance was 20% over FY09, 
18% over FY10 and 8% over FY11. Um, this is, this next line is a, a major takeaway um, for our staff and also something that we continue to learn about and explore. It's one of our uh, learning points for radical hospitality. Our individual uh, gifts in FY12 increased three times. Um, the, the individual gift went down from about $150 to $100 per gift as an average. Um, but we did increase those gifts, as I said, three times. Now, um, in contradiction to that, our season subscribers dropped 30%. Um, and they've dropped additionally in this season as well. So one of the major questions, the major things we're trying to learn about radical hospitality is, in a world where cost is not an issue, how do we incentivize loyalty? Um, from our patrons. So um, if you have thoughts about that, I welcome them during our, our Q&A. Um, but it is something that I think over this year we'll learn a lot about. And even in our third season, as we start to see patterns develop, we'll get a better understanding of what that looks like. Um, of our Radical Hospitality users last season, 47% of them were 30 or younger. 33% of them had annual household incomes of under $25,000 a year. And 30% of them were people of color. Now to this season. So far this season, as you can see, our, uh, the diversity of our audiences continues to grow in our Radical Hospitality users. 60% of our audience members so far this season who use Radical Hospitality are 30 or younger. Um, and like I said, that's about half of our guests. 37% um, of them have annual household incomes of under $25,000. And we're, we're remaining stable with 30% being people of color. So how do we keep this radical? A conversation that comes up with our staff frequently is if radical hospitality has revealed itself to be a sustainable business model and is not requiring a tremendous amount of risk on our part, then what in the world makes it radical? Um, well, we may have been under the impression initially that radical hospitality was just a free ticket program. Um, we have since been freed from our delusions. Uh, probably many of you with more experience than me out there could have told me that ahead of time. So here's another takeaway alert. The genuine pursuit of revolutionizing access is completely systemic. By learning that free tickets alone don't cut it, we have learned that the only way to stay radical in our pursuit is to understand that true evolution is systemic. Over the first season of Radical Hospitality, our audience taught us that their preferred method of contact with the theater might not necessarily be with us right there in the space. That's a difficult thing for artists to hear. So, inter-producer in residence Jamil Jude and the free speech program designed to give our audience access to mixed blood way, way beyond showtime. Free speech allows our audience members to share their opinions, their questions, their insights, their accusations, their suggestions publicly via Twitter, Facebook, our blog, and even on our lobby walls. Um, we put up huge sheets of paper, probably many of you do this as well, and give them the opportunity to just write their thoughts um, before the show, after the show, at intermission, and we leave them up through the run of a production. Um, interestingly enough, our artistic director tells me that he gets a lot less um, feedback from our guests as a result of it, so it must be um, some way to let people feel that their voice is heard. Uh, Jamil and the staff conduct post-show forums after every performance, and a Mixed Blood staffer live tweets those conversations to loop in anyone who's participating from outside the theater. We were shocked to find that there are audience members who see the show one night, and then they'll jump right in via Twitter the next night and take part in the post-show conversation. Um, we host a, tw a tweet seat night during each run. Um, and this has been totally part of that marathon philosophy when we first started the tweet seat nights. It was me. Jamil, and then a good friend of our artistic directors who just felt sorry for us, who tweeted with us in the back row. And now um, we're in, let's see, uh, six productions later, and now we fill the entire backseat of the theater for every tweet seat night, um, and people are starting to ask for more rows. Um, a really terrific, interesting um, thing happened that I hadn't anticipated at all when one night during our tweet seats recently, uh, the artists backstage started tweeting with the audience um, about their interactions, which was totally value added for the audience members. Um, of course, there is a balance there to be found for artists. Um, we can't take away their cell phones while they're in the dressing room, so we let them do what they want. But um, they also tweeted to our designers, who didn't happen to even be in the space anymore and were, had moved on to new projects, saying, hey, I noticed that this costume has you know, a theme of these colors. What is that about? And the costume designer would start tweeting 
tweeting back saying, well, this is kind of some of my inspiration. So it was pretty, uh, I thought it was a pretty fascinating result of that program. Um, each Sunday matinee um, we, is followed by something called a Sunday salon, and that is um, a salon topic discussion with panelists who come in who are experts in the community who speak to very specific topics around the production um, that are curated by both our producer in residence, our artistic director, and then some of our liaisons and community members who offer their suggestions about what the thematic content in, is in a piece. Um, I have to be very clear in saying this about Mixed Bloods, uh, mixed bloods Pie specifically. Our budget is not constructed largely of our ticket sales. About 18 to 20 percent of our budget every year is a result of our ticket sales. So it's not a significant chunk of money. It requires about $180,000 to $200,000 a year roughly for us to uh, replace ticket sales for Radical Hospitality. For us, that's not a significant um, sacrifice. What it does require is that we change the way we look at our funding structure and broaden our understanding of what's possible um, in terms of our funding partnerships. Um, we've been able to think outside the box and reach out to social service organizations who feel, um, per bullet point number three, that pursuing theater making is a vehicle for civic partnership and a quality of life indicator. Uh, we recently received some funding from Allianz um, for, for our transportation fund, um, and they acknowledged uh, in agreement with Mixed Blood that just like shelter and food um, and relationships, that creative expression is a quality of life indicator. Um, so that's been a huge way for us to sort of think outside the box about what our partnerships can look like and how um, our organization can serve as both a theater company and a social service organization. Whoops. So um, mixed blood is set up when our guests come into the space. We ask our funders, we ask our guests, we ask um, any constituent in the space to consider paying it forward and supporting someone who came before or after them to see a show. So in that way, we really feel that our constituents, if they are able, become supporters of a vision that can ensure access to live theater for all at Mixed Blood. So that's a formalized presentation for you. I've probably skipped over a million things, but um, how are we doing for time? Good. Am I? Yes. Did I 16 minutes, my personal record. Um, I, I'm happy, we have about another 20 minutes. So if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Or if you just want to talk um, more specifically about uh, something you've heard today, that's fine too. Yeah, I think, I think I have to ask you to come to the mic. We're being recorded, sorry. Hi, Gary Sayers, the Alliance Theater. Hi. Um, Love the idea of the tweet seats and have heard other people utilizing them and engaging digitally with other people. Um, some people talked about it today in the first uh, session. Um, do you offer your tweet seats for free? Because that's one of the things we were going to do exactly what you're talking about, the back row, make them tweet seats, let these influencers or anybody who wants to, to come to the theater and get those seats, they get to come for free and they get to sit there and tweet. Love the idea of the artists in the back though. Um, also uh, doing great. that value add. <laughs> it was great. We do offer them for free. Um, you know, one of the things I should say sort of around that, tweet seats are like a hugely, I'm coming out here, you guys. <laughs> Tweet seats are a really volatile topic of conversation, and I think sort of more broadly the issue is really like how much access do we allow and how much of the rules, the traditional rules in our space, how much of our etiquette are we willing to violate in order to offer that kind of access. Um, what has really helped for us is being incredibly, possibly overly communicative about the process. Um, when somebody comes up on a tweet seat night, we post big signs in our lobby um, saying, we have tweet seeders tonight. We're asking you, this is an access issue for mixed blood, and it in fact happens to be. Um, we do have many guests who, because of some disabilities, are very uncomfortable with social situations or with crowds and don't like to be in the space. So this gives them one more way to engage with us. Um, so we ask our audience members actively to participate in an access effort. Um, we ask them to just be considerate and be respectful of the fact that these people are doing something different than the, what they're doing. 
Um, we do make sure that it's always in the back of the house so you will never see any ambient light coming off of phones. We ask people to dim the phones um, so that you don't have such a, you know, a bright screen and also obviously to silence their phones. Um, but when people come up to the box office on a tweet seat night, uh, we do alert them as well that there will be tweeters in the back of the house um, and to please not feel uncomfortable about it and here's why we do it. Uh, we also, with every tweeter who comes in the door, their ticket is of course comped um, and we give them a rundown of best practices for tweet seats. Um, I'm happy to email that to anybody who wants to see it if you just want to take a look at what we do. But we say, this is why we do it. These are the things that are great to talk about. We will never censor you or cut your tweets off, but please be respectful of some of the conventions of, you know, not um, you know, not uh, giving your review of an actor's performance while they're on the stage or, you know, really this is more about what are some of the themes in the work that you want to talk about or explore or dig deeper into. We do also have a senior staff member who is always the moderator for Tweet Seats who um, serves kind of a pop-up video function in some way by throwing out little facts about what's happening on stage and what may be happening in the play, um, but also sort of steers people in a direction that does talk more about themes and content. Um, and we also have an orientation at the first day of rehearsal with all of our artists to tell them this is what will happen on one day and probably a couple of days because we aren't controlling it like that. So um, you may see people in the house, you may see some of the light from the stage, and also you may really be asked by our audience members to participate on a deeper level than you, than you do at other theaters. So um, we ask our, uh, all of our artists to submit to us any social media profile of theirs that they're welcome or that they're comfortable with and we, um, we use it to say, hey, you should follow these people um, during tweet seats so the artists can engage if they want to. We also let the artists know that the people in the audience are non-traditional theater goers by and large. So sometimes people yell back at the artists. Sometimes they get up and walk out of the space and come back in. Sometimes they uh, turn on their phones or they answer a phone call in the middle of a show. Um, at first, we had a little bit of like staff panic about that when it first happened. We just weren't sure uh, how to handle it all and actually hadn't really considered what that would look like. Um, and when we then had the opportunity to sort of see like, hey, these people haven't been to the theater and we can either embarrass them and go in and say, you know, you don't know the rules, here's how it works. Or we can meet them where they are, which is another thing we've talked about today. Um, and just say, okay, we as a company and as an artistic institution cracked open our doors as wide as we could get them. So if we are authentically pursuing access for these people and inviting them to become theater goers in our community, then we have to meet them where they are and say, this is how you see theater, that's all right. We'll work with it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gabriel Hi. Shanks from the Drama League of New York. I'm very curious about um, <clears throat> the conversation you might be having with cost versus value in yeah. the work. I think a lot of us give, you know, have free programming, not on our main stage perhaps, but elsewhere. And there is this um, underlying current of feedback that we get that if something is free, it has no value. So, and, um, so I'm wondering how your evolution about the way you talk about the value of your work has changed in this process. Yeah. And then specifically to the declining subscriptions, how, how is it changing your thoughts about the subscriber model and what it, uh, where are you going with that going forward? Yep. Um, well, so to answer your first question, mixed blood specific information, uh, we have a 37 uh, year history in the Twin Cities and um, an award winning one. So I feel like on some level mixed blood does come with a bit of a track record for uh, excellent artistry. I'm very proud of that and I know our staff is too. So um, we, you know, that kind of helps a little bit being not a startup. We also have artists who are not ensemble members, but we do have many artists who come back show after show and work with us, uh, and also work at some of the other theater companies in town. So um, we are able to make a very strong case for the fact that our, the excellence of our work has not shifted. It's the same artists coming back. Um, we're doing, still doing new work and making that new play development a commitment. Um, so we, we are able to make on some level the case that the work has not changed. Um, one of the ways we try to shift that conversation also is about saying what we are trying to do in offering this complimentary ticket is to create users of theater. So our hope is, and this is my little um, feat of analysis that I hope to accomplish by the end of next season, um, 
we are going to track some of these users and see if, in fact, we are creating users of theater in the Twin Cities. So if you come in and take a radical hospitality ticket, are you going now to the Guthrie to see what they have going on? Or are you going to Penumbra or Illusion in the Twin Cities and checking out something they have there? I'm not quite sure how that works yet. We've had some early conversations about tracking it. Um, but my hope is that we are creating users on some level. Um, also, I think this is kind of a long game effort. Um, our hope is that as people, um, you know, as some of these college students graduate or as people um, find employment or, you know, that some of them will then consider themselves donors um, and stakeholders in an important process so that they will start to sort of um, feed into that as well. So, you know, I, it, the conversation comes up all the time. We are always speaking to it and thinking about it. The use of the word free has been a huge discussion in our staff. We've gone with no cost, which I think is like perhaps, you know, a little passive aggressive on some level. So, you know, we're kind of trying to move toward, let's just say it, it's free theater. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a conversation all the time. Uh, the subscription model, I'm kind of learning uh, really what we have, the assumption we've operated under so far is that there is no discount to our subscription model. Um, you buy a subscription and it pays for X amount of tickets to the shows at no discount. Um, previously that was working because people, you know, it was convenient for people and they could make sure that they had the seat. Uh, this time around, I mean, obviously we're hearing, well, I can just walk up and get the ticket. How, you know, and we don't sell out every show, so people make a good assumption that they can probably get a seat. And so, you know, that there's no incentive for loyalty. Uh, what I think will be the case is that we'll have to crack open our doors and provide greater access to the material. That we'll have to start allow, holding pass holder events where our pass holders or subscribers, donors, are able to come in and experience something different or unique about the process. We've just started opening a couple of rehearsals um, to see how that goes. So far it seems to be going fairly well. Obviously that's a slippery slope to go down. Um, and it's constant conversation and communication with the artistic teams. Um, but uh, it seems to, we got a recent email from a pass holder saying, I have never in my lifetime known how it goes from start to finish. And she sat in on the first read through. Um, and so, and we'll be coming back for the show. So I think giving that sense of process and that you are in fact a stakeholder will make some difference. If you guys have better ideas, send them, say them out loud. Yeah. <laughs> the awkward walk to the mic. Um, my name is Raphael. I'm from Soho Rep in New York City. I have two questions for sure. you. Was it a challenge for Jack and you to steer your whole board on side to, to go for this plan? And secondly, I'm curious, what do your peer theaters in the Twin Cities think and react to this program? Yeah. Uh, it was, um, took a couple, I wasn't here when the board got on board, um, but what I understand about the process is that through Jack's presentation of that research uh, and through determining what the barriers to access really were, the board actually unanimously voted to go for it. Um, we don't have a, a traditional board in the sense that um, there are people who are high net worth individuals who come in and support us from other industries. Many of them are, work in social service organizations or are in profound support of the mission itself. So we have a unique board in that sense and they all kind of said, you know, let's give it, let's give it a shot. It did, as I said before, make fiscal sense on some level too. It wasn't the world's most enormous risk. Um, we weren't in danger of shutting the doors if we needed to go back from it. But what they have sort of committed to, um, initially committed to three years of the model to see how it worked. Um, and they've been talking recently about committing to it into perpetuity. So uh, stay tuned for that. But you know, I don't think it's been a, a difficult process to get them on board. I have to tell you that since Radical Hospitality launched, they've been our greatest advocates. Um, they are, <laughs> we put out a board challenge that they would all join Twitter. <laughs> and many of them joined and now talk about and promote the work that we're doing via Radical Hospitality on their social media platforms. Um, they also come as volunteers uh, to the theater and work reading guests, showing them to their seats, reading uh, aloud audience surveys um, if people aren't able to do them themselves. So they're, they're a really active group of people. We've had hugely mixed response in the Twin Cities to it. Some theater companies are f and other arts organizations are furious with us 
um, and feel that we are devaluing the field at large. Um, it's, it's, a valid, it's a valid assertion and something that we're totally willing to talk through. Um, but the bottom line is we're the, we can't keep our doors open, nor are we serving our mission, if a bunch, 15 white people from the suburbs come to see neighbors at mixed blood. It's not, um, Jack is uh, fond of saying, if that's the case, then this is not a show about a minstrel show, it is one. So it is, it is essentially mission driven that we pursue the diversification of our audiences. I am not suggesting that that is the case for all theaters everywhere, but that is ours and uh, we're all really committed to it. So the conversation is a huge one. Some theaters have been really supportive of it and think it's a great thing that we should try. Um, we've had a kind of unique funding situation in the Twin Cities because the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra kind of at the same time launched their new membership program, which is $5 tickets to every show. So we sort of had a, you know, a little bit of bolstering from some other arts organizations who are trying non-traditional ticket models. Well, and really interestingly, um, Jack is not leaving mixed blood at all in any time soon, but one of the things he's very wisely thinking about is succession planning. So, you know, really thinking about how to separate a founder from the, the work and mission going forward is, a, is central to a lot of our conversations too. Jack is really open to it, and I think it, it would be very scary, so, you know, to have that conversation. So he's been brave about it. Um, it does help to have somebody who's so deeply invested in the work. When I first started working at Mixed Blood, I was thought, you know, I admired it fr from afar and thought, oh, no, I'm going to see the man behind the curtain. <laughs> and there isn't one. I mean, he's been remarkably committed to that vision. So that is good. Uh, speaking of audience demographics, I feel like I should say also, we have this new weird survey model that I feel like I should share with you. Um, we have you know, the survey problem of handing out surveys ahead of time and everybody shoves them into their pockets or you find them on the floor as people leave. Um, we decided to kind of go right at it and we put them all on 200 clipboards, um, which is a little bit more logistically challenging in preparation. But as people come through the door, we hand them the clipboard with a pencil and their program and the survey and say, if you could fill this out for us, here's why we need it. And we have a little tiny elevator speech and then they go in. And then our staff sticks around and wanders through the aisles and through the house and sits and talks with people, collects their surveys. <laughs> and sometimes we even just stand and wait for somebody to finish their survey. Um, so it's like a little work intensive, but we have a 90% return rate on our surveys. So our data is solid in that sense. Um, and it's our audiences have been remarkably understanding about it. They'll come and they'll say, oh, every single night I get the survey night. Um, it's usually between six and nine performances of a, of a run. So it's not every night, but it's enough that we feel like we get a good sample of that information. Yeah. Got to cut it off? OK, I, this is the last one. I'm sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Linnea. I'm from Dad's Garage Theater in Atlanta. Um, and we're actually uh, really pretty hardly considering doing a, a free night every week on Thursdays. Um, I was wondering if you have a sense of how many of your paying audience members are still paying and how much of them were converted to uh, the freebie nights and did you lose your subscribers because they're now not paying or they're just now not coming? Yep. Uh, according to our data, they're not coming. Um, what we ask for in exchange for a Radical Hospitality ticket is contact information. So on some level, we can, we can track it. We do give tickets to guests, so there are a few people who slip through that way. Um, but it looks like, and this is information I really feel like we want to go back in and dig into, but it looks like they're not coming. Um, we've sent out surveys to say, why? Where did you go? Did you just hate the idea? Is it that you don't want to sit next to the person you'll inevitably sit next to in the space? What is it? Uh, you can be really frank with us. So, um, yeah, it looks like our, the lapsed subscribers are not returning. Um, it, recently, we've gotten some feedback from that survey where people have said, oh, now that you sent this survey out, I'll resubscribe. I just forgot. Or, but that's a very small portion of them. What was your first question? I can't remember it. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't actually have that data. What we we're in the middle of processing it right now um, because we have now we have a f one show. We're opening our second show tomorrow in the second season of Radical Hospitality. So now we have some comparative data. So that information I'll actually have concretely probably by the end of the season and get a sense of who didn't come back or who did. Um, we're a little early in the process to know that, but I think that will be really central to how we go forward. The interesting thing about it is when we started Radical Hospitality, I promise I'm wrapping up, I'm sorry. Um, when we started Radical Hospitality, our marketing director was violently opposed to it. She hated the idea and said to our staff, I know how to sell tickets, I don't know how to give them away. Um, and we all rolled our eyes, but it's really a valid point. Um, the great thing about that was that she fought all year to make sure that those guaranteed admissions were filled. She then resigned at the end of the season, and this season, everyone is an enormous proponent for radical hospitality. What that has meant is that on some level, we've forgotten about people purchasing guaranteed admissions. So that is another lesson learned. We really have to go forward knowing there is definitely a balance here in order to support our budgetary goals. Um, so there's that. Oh, we have got to wrap it up, I'm sorry to say. Um, do we, do we want to take, I guess if you stop by and mention what you, yeah. do we have to vote together or how does that work? Well, do we have a general consensus? Does anybody, say again? Income. Income? Income, Income it is. Income. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. I'm happy to answer any other questions if you have them. I'm Amanda at mixedblood.com. <laughs>